have a nice day, Howard. Welcome to the channel. It's always an honor, and I am the luckiest translator in the world, but I let you be John and his questions. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Yo quiero empezar preguntándote, Howard, sobre cómo ha evolucionado la tecnología en tu campo desde que comenzaste en la industria. ¿Qué desafíos y oportunidades se han presentado? How has evolved the technology in your field since you began on the industry back in the 80s? And what challenges and opportunities has yes, had presented in your amazing resume, by the way? <laughs> Well, I mean, a lot has changed. I mean, I got into this 40 years ago uh, professionally. I was 18 years old. And, um, you know, I, I always loved monsters and movies growing up. And that's what drew me to doing this. And I, I learned early on that I knew there were people that made monsters for movies. So there, you know, as you would have a cameraman or actors or costume, there had to be somebody that made the monsters. So I wanted to know what that was and i uh and there really wasn't much information out there i mean we didn't have the internet you know there weren't any books or really you know very few publications and magazines but i figured it out and um started making things in my bedroom and uh and they were probably very awful and terrible looking but you know i was teaching myself um but regarding your question i mean a lot has changed uh, you know it used to be very much like a, a garage sort of setup where it was just a bunch of guys who loved monsters who loved rock and roll and made monsters and it was just you just did whatever you had to do and you did everything you did everything from a to z so you did all the processes yourself nowadays <clears throat> it's very uh departmentalized so like at my studio at KB effects we have, you know, like a sculpting department and a painting department and a molding department and fabrication. So, you know, we all work on everything, but it's it's very much departmentalized. And and I kind of miss the good old days where we just did everything like, OK, this is your project. Follow it through. I think, you know, uh, as as the years have gone on and, and the world of makeup effects has become more of a um, a, a business that things have changed structurally you know it's it's the industry is very corporate now the film industry is very corporate so that doesn't give you um as much freedom as we used to have you know it's it's rare that you have a director who's a singular voice i'd say there's maybe quentin tarantino and james cameron and jj abrams and and um uh, christopher nolan that are really singular voices but a lot of times you go to set and there's 10 producers there, um, you know, putting their two cents in, which I never really care what they think. I want to know what the director thinks and we'll go from there. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I mean, you know, we all started off doing uh, foam latex uh, for appliances and makeups and suits. And, you know, through the years it's evolved and now silicone is very prominent. People love silicone makeups and, and there's these transfers, these simple little 3D transfers we, we use. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still the same, you know, idea. It's just things, you know, things change, you know, as, as the digital world, you know, had come into view as far as like digital cinematography, you know, we had to adjust how we applied things, how we painted things, you know, how we designed things because that camera sees more than your human eye sees. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always a challenge and, and not just for my department, for every single department, you know, costumes, set dressing, set design, all has to accommodate the, uh, the changes with digital, um, you know, photography nowadays and the way things are lit. Um, yeah, it's, it's very different animal. It's a very different animal than, than it used to be back in the, in the eighties and nineties. I también es importante, Howard, y es sobre como cofundador de tu compañía junto con Nicotero y todo lo que ha trascendido, ¿cuál ha sido el enfoque y la filosofía central de la empresa desde sus inicios hasta la actualidad? Yo sé que desde sus inicios comenzaste con Transers y ahorita con American Primeval, entonces coméntame esa evolución. Okay, I love this question. As a founder of KMB EFX Group, what has been the approach and the philosophy, the central philosophy of that enterprise, the creation of visual effects 
and make up from quality. Okay, John mentioned it, our friend Greg Nicotero, he was there on the channel. And of course, he mentioned also that you started on that cold movie that is Transfers, and now with American Primeval. So go ahead. Right. All right. Um, well, let's see. You know, I think when, because originally KB was, was myself and Bob Kurtzman and Greg Nicotero, and we started it in 1988 and and we were all best friends we used to rent a house together we all lived in a house for years together and we worked at different shops together different studios like at mark showstrom's when we did evil dead 2 and they went on to do um uh phantasm 2 and deep star 6 working with mark um showstrom but at a certain point we decided like we were we were tired of working for other people and not getting the the recognition and not making the money we felt that we had earned so we decided to stop working for people and try to get our own jobs and and that was difficult because nobody knew us you know who we were but we just started anyhow and we ended up working on this little teeny independent movie called um intruder which was being directed by a friend of ours named scott spiegel who co-wrote evil dead 2 who's tied into the sam raimi world Anyhow, we did it for almost no money at all, but we were able to get our company going. And and though it took years and years and years to make any money whatsoever, and, and it's true, it takes about five years to get your company up and running and, and make a dime. Um, but our our one of our big breaks was um, you know, we did this movie for Disney called Gross Anatomy, which is kind of a goofy film, but we had to do all these cadavers. And we'd never done it before, but we knew how. So we made all these cadavers in different stages of, of autopsy for this medical drama comedy thing. And from that movie, we got a phone call from Kevin Costner, who asked, uh, you know, who wanted to meet us. So we went to his office and he said, well, I'm doing this movie and uh, I need all these dead buffalo and buffalo, mechanical buffaloes. And we, Bob and I were like, yeah, we can do that. We didn't know how to do that at all. That was so big. And uh, what we ended up doing is making everything based on what we thought it was what we would need and, and be as smart as possible. And that movie ended up being Dances with Wolves. And that was a really big stepping stone. So that took us from these guys, you know, that were just doing like these low budget gore movies and, and horror movies to bigger films. And I think, you know, nobody ever anticipated Dances with Wolves being as big as it uh, as it was, you know, winning Oscars and you know, just being a huge success. So, you know, I mean, I think our philosophy at K&B, and now that it's it's just Greg Nicotero and myself, it's it's a matter of just trying to do the best work we can um, w within the uh, time frame, uh, because it's not even about the money. It's really about how much time you have. You know, we love to have a lot of time. Sometimes I'd rather have more time than money. You know, and in in the good old days, we'd have six months, nine months to build things. Now it's like weeks, you know, they give you like, you know, five, six weeks to do to build a show, which is virtually impossible. But, you know, we do our very best and we like to have fun. I mean, it's difficult now because I think in the shop, Greg and I have we don't get to do a lot really any hands on work anymore because there's a lot of um, orchestrating and administrative uh, responsibilities we have, you know, taking phone calls, doing Zoom meetings now, which is everybody's favorite. And uh, just trying to figure out how to do things and, and also working with our crew. And currently, I think we have about 30 people working at KB. Even now, during the strike, um, we didn't want to let anybody go. So we kept everybody on uh, for a, it's a shorter week. But, um, you know, we don't get to do as much on, on, on in the shop, but really we get to do a lot on set. So when I go to set, I. I handle all the makeup and uh, and makeup effects and whatever else needs to happen. I'll, I'm the makeup department head, so I run the entire department, which is great, and and oversee everything else I need to oversee. And then obviously Greg has transitioned to being an executive producer and a writer and a director, so he has successfully made the leap um, to to you know becoming above the line, which is really fantastic. And we all support him, and he's really really good at it um but i mean for me it's always about it being fun and when it's not fun I'm, i lose interest um you know i know how to do makeup i know how to do makeup effects uh but it's it's sometimes difficult to get people to understand 
that this has to be fun as well. And yes, it's, it can be stressful. There's always a lot of pressure, but you can still have a bunch of laughs and you get to be with your friends while you're shooting uh, a project, a film or TV. And then, you know, you had brought up American Primeval. So that's a show that I, I was working on all this year. And, um, you know, obviously when the SAG strike, the actor strike happened, we had to pause filming. So I, in January, we'll go back and finish that. I have about three more weeks, but I love Westerns and, and it was super fun. And Peter Berg is the director of that, of that series. It'll be on Netflix, I think sometime in 2024, but it gave us a lot of great opportunity to do some really fun things and really great things. And, you know, I, I look at every film that we do and every TV show we do as a new adventure. Um, and I'm always looking to kind of try to reinvent the wheel to some degree. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. So I really, you know, like, well, we did it this way last time, but let's do it. Diff let's figure out a better way to do it or something new that we haven't seen before. And, and something that just creates more of a challenge for us in the shop and a bit of a challenge on set, which I don't, I never mind. I, I'm not afraid of, of trying something new. I think it's, it's a good thing because that's what keeps you going. It keeps you interested. I promise to not translate, but I will bro my promise because John needs to know that American Primeval will be premiere Oof. the next year. Wow. So yes. I will tell John, American Primeval, oye, aquí nos dijo que fue, se detuvo un poco por la, tú sabes, por la huelga. Enero del otro año, probablemente en Netflix. Wow. Oh, and, Good and news. Hopefully, and hopefully in Netflix, Latin America, man, we need to see that series. Yeah, it's going to be good. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's six hours long, so it's, it's six episodes. And, you know, Peter Berg, I've worked with Pete. This was like my ninth project with Pete. And um, and he just trusts me. And I trust him. He lets me do what I feel is best. You know, he'll sometimes I get too gory. So he'll, he'll say like, oh, that's too much. No, 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 no. We're, that's too much, too much. And I'm like, oh, Pete, come on. Let's let's just go for it. He's like, just tone it back a little bit. Because I always like to go a little bit big. And, you know, they had somewhere to go. So, but, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of times you know you're on a movie and and you have a very specific idea what you want to do and the director doesn't feel that same way and you try to kind of navigate uh the best way so that you can actually be able to do what you think is going to be best for the film at the end of the day i mean really at the end of the day we know better than anybody you know what's going to work and and nowadays and it's not taking away anything from any new director, but we have a lot of young new directors who don't have the experience and, and are still learning. And I'm more than happy to answer any question that a, a director has or even a producer, because producers are kind of young these days, too, and, and not fully experienced. And, and uh, you know, we're all there to help. We want to do at the end of the day, we want the project to be great. You know, we all have a common goal regarding what we want the film or the tv show to be at the end of the at the end we want it to be great we don't we're not working on it because it's, it's not going to be good so but i think sometimes we come um into a, a bit of a, a wall where maybe someone who's not as experienced feels a little insecure uh and in terms of being uh having getting suggestions and and maybe we should do it this way or maybe we should do it that way you know I also like to go to the table if I feel something isn't correct. I want to go with a solution. And I think that's very important. I think anybody can be critical and go, I don't like this. Or I don't like that. Or this should be this. But if you don't have a solution or an option, um, it doesn't mean anything. So I always think about it. And I'm like, hey, we, we could do this, this, and this. And this is how we would do it. And I think it'll save time and money. And it'll be even better than what we anticipated. Um, you know, I'll tell a quick story about Kill Bill. So when I was working on Kill Bill with Quentin, you know, we were, there's the scene where, where Uma's character fights Daryl Hannah's character at the, you know, in the trailer. And so originally, Quentin had written that the fight continues outside of the trailer and that Uma ends up killing Daryl Hannah. That was the original thing. And we rigged this whole gag, like all this blood sprang out of her neck. But the day before we shot it, Quentin came in and he said, he said to me, Hey, I had a dream last night about that scene and I, I'm going to rewrite it and we're not going to kill Daryl anymore. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, no, no, I want to do is the fight will stay inside. She plucks the other eye out and now she's blind. There's a black mamba in the trailer and she can't get out. And he said, that's way worse. That's way worse than 
than her neck being slit and dying. And I went, you know, you're right. That is way worse. It's going to be way better. So I said, let me rethink how to do this. I, I spent months trying to figure out this original effect with the fight continuing on outside as written. So then I had like two days to figure out how to do the new version, which ended up working out great. And it was simple, simple things and simple, simple gags. But, you know, that's a matter of trusting your director. And I mean, Quentin Tarantino is probably the greatest living director there is. And, and um, you know, I, I would never question his sensibilities or anything. I mean, I, you know, he'll come up with crazy things and I'm like, yep, sounds good. We'll figure out how to do it, you know, and, and between myself and Greg Nicotero has done a tremendous amount of set work with Quentin as well on like Inglorious Bastards and Hateful Eight and, and, um, and a few other films, obviously, because we've done all Quentin's movies from day one. Um, so we definitely have a, a language and a, um, you know, rapport with him and, and he's loyal to us and we're very loyal to him. So, you know, it's nice when you have a relationship like that with the director. I'm that way with Peter Berg. I, I respect Pete beyond belief and we have a, a common language. So it doesn't take much to, you know, we don't have to say a lot to understand what he wants and what I want and how it's all going to work together. And he just lets me go with it. So it's it's nice to know that I'll I'll probably finish my career working for Peter Berg, which will be great. So he's a he's a great director. And before I let my friend do the question, just for that a scene is my favorite. That's just from that scene. Kill Bill Two is my favorite of the Kill Bills, and <laughs> I always thought that Daryl Hannah deserved a nomination for his act, for her acting. Amazing, amazing. I love it. John, continue. Siempre le quería preguntar sobre el tema del terror y ¿Cuál es el proceso creativo para desarrollar personajes y efectos visuales únicos? Por ejemplo, hay dos en particular que la verdad de mi adolescencia siempre me impacté, que es Espejos Siniestros, Mayros y La Profecía del No Nacido. Entonces quería que me comentara de pronto el proceso creativo sobre el terror. Y claro, no sé si quepa mal sobre... Tu top 3 de películas de terror, así como le dije a Greta. What is your process, your creative process for developing makeup and visual effects for characters in the genre of terror? John, eh, there is a lot of movies, I, we can do a list, but John loves two movies that are Mirrors and The Unborn. And if you want it because Greg passes this test, if you, if you agree to do it, Tell me your top three horror or terror movies. Can be for yours or for another director in which you haven't worked. Go ahead. Okay. So, so first I'll answer the first question. So regarding the relationship and how we go about designing using, using practical makeup effects and visual effects. So, you know, we learned early on that that was the way to, to approach filmmaking and the future of filmmaking. It wasn't a matter of fighting uh, you know, against visual effects and CGI, it was to join them and be able to bring what we could to the table that would best benefit the project. And I mean, there was a struggle early on when Jurassic Park came out, we were like, oh, we're done. We're all extinct. This is, this is the end of us, you know, but it wasn't. Um, and, and Greg and I decided we need to figure out a way to work with the visual effects department. And we did. The first, um, film Greg did that really was heavy VFX uh, with the marriage was Sin City, Robert Rodriguez's Sin City. Um, there was a lot of, of practical makeup and a lot of makeup effects. And for me, my first real you know dive into that was the, um, the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I really learned how to work with visual effects because we did a lot of creature stuff and a lot of makeups and then visual effects. Did a lot of augmentation, a lot of a lot of characters. So we had to marry the two. We wanted them to feel like they were in the same, the same world and the same universe. And, and it was very, very important for us. And you know, through all these years, the last 20 years, Greg and I have really strived to um to do that. And and the you know, the people we make friends with very quickly are the visual effects department, because we want to work with them, make sure it's it's very harmonious. And um you know, that everything works well. So we'll go over uh, effects, we'll go over characters, um, you know, we'll usually lead the design phase and then they'll follow our lead, which is nice. You know, I, I, we don't get 
designs from visual effects and then we have to figure out how to make it it's always we start because it's we're building something real and practical you know that ends usually has to be on an actor perhaps and then you know we share all the information you know be it digital files be it practical sculptures be it whatever whatever visual effects needs you know and and we we figure out um you know how best to do this i mean i i'm a huge horror fanatic i would say like Hmm. I'd say films. Okay. Well, films that K and B did that are great horror movies, great terror films that have a good combination of everything. I love From Dust Till Dawn. I think that is a great movie and great stuff. I love Army of Darkness. That's one of my all time favorites. Uh, super, super fun. Um, let's see another good horror movie, another good horror movie that we did. There's a lot of them. I mean, we didn't do Evil Dead 2 under K and B. We worked for Mark Showstrom, but Evil Dead 2 is one of my all-time favorites as well. I think looking at a horror films that I really love, I mean, John Carpenter is one of my all-time favorite horror directors, and um, you know, we all go to The Thing as probably the the pinnacle of you know, makeup effects, uh, you know, m horror movies, and, and the whole movie is fantastic. You know, it's funny, that movie, when it came out, did very poorly and got very bad reviews. But that was also the summer that E.T. came out and Poltergeist came out. So it had a lot of competition and people wanted to see a feel good alien movie and not a is your next is the person next to you an alien and is he going to rip your head off and, you know, drain all your blood. So kind of like the timing didn't work out. Um, I love American Werewolf. I think John Landis is brilliant and, and one of my favorite filmmakers and, and people as well. I love John Landis. He's great. Uh, that movie is a great combination of, of uh, you know, comedy, horror, and also the, some of the greatest makeup effects ever done by Rick Baker, you know, who who I'm like, I idolize Rick Baker, you know, ever since I f figured out who Rick Baker was when I was probably 12 years old, I've just been in awe of Rick. And even though I've known Rick for ever and ever, I still get very, like, excited and nervous. I'm still a fan, you know. Uh, and then I'd say, hmm, let me think, a third a third movie. It's always the third one that is so difficult, isn't it? Um, wow. Uh, what would I say? The third movie? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, there's some good stuff out there. A lot of the stuff, you know, that, that sounds funny because we do a lot of, we have done a lot of gore films, but I'm not like a gore fan. I'm not like big into blood and guts. You know, I, lo I love character makeups. I love, um, you know... Uh, uh, fantasy elements. I mean, I think the, the, you know, I think looking at the stuff from Walking Dead is great. I mean, I think Walking Dead is, is a real big achievement and that's all Greg Nicotero and, and the, and the team at KNB. I have nothing at all to do with Walking Dead. That's Greg's baby. And, you know, in order to create, we had to create like a brand, a new look for the zombies or the walkers rather. We don't call them zombies for the walkers. And and I think that Greg and his team did a really great job doing that. We they're they're very very specific, and now it's fun to see other films and TV shows kind of steal the or not steal, but you know be influenced by the the designs that we've been doing for 13 years. You know, and it's always a difficult show because I see Greg's you know always trying to one up and one up. You know, he doesn't want to do the same thing over and over again. You know. And I, and I, I appreciate that. And I think that's a great thing. Whenever we start a new season of a Walking Dead show, Greg redesigns everything and has all new sculptures. It would be easy and lazy for us to just pull molds off the shelf and use the same stuff over and over again. But we, we love to redo stuff and it keeps the guys at the shop enthusiastic and excited um, and, and busy as well. So, you know, there's always new inventive things that Greg and his team um, are thinking of how to, you know, bring all that cool stuff to life. So it's not the same thing for the last 13 years. So, um, you know, I think that nowadays on the on the Walking Dead shows, the the makeups are the standout. Of course, they they've always been great. Um, I think early on in the show, and this is my opinion, the writing was so great. I mean, I was totally a, a, a massive fan for definitely the first six seasons. And just watch that show every Sunday night. I never missed it. And I just, I thought the writing was exceptional and, uh, and the acting and everything about it. So that also adds to the, you know, adds to the, the mix of, you know, you can, you can have great makeups wandering around, but if you don't have great story 
and actors to pull it off, then you don't really have much. You know, it just becomes a, a visual experience, and you want more than that. And I think in the beginning, Walking Dead was definitely more than that. You know, you know, especially with Frank Darabont, you know, being involved in the beginning, and he's he's a fantastic writer. So. Muy bien, eso sí es una respuesta increíble. Vamos a culminar, bueno, con dos en una muy cortas. ¿Cómo define su trabajo en una palabra? Y bueno, debido a que Mosco por, por problemas de internet se fue, él le iba a preguntar sobre si él estuvo en Colombia para lo de mi, Milla 22. Entonces, que si alguna vez le gustaría viajar a Colombia. Ok, two short questions for short answers. Uh, the first one is try to define your career in one word and later i will do the second question okay so my career in one world word i'll say um i'll say magical and i love that magical means the same in spanish magico. and the second we got uh, there is a friend of the channel uh, his name is andres mosquera like myself andres carvajal but andres mosquera he cannot uh, lot but he got a really cool question you came here to colombia when you feel occurred of Peter Bear film at uh, mm -hmm. mile 22? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, what, wow. Why, why do you think? It's crazy because this movie, uh, that movie became like, a, it's a cult classic here in Colombia because all the people that knows Bogota <laughs> go, yeah. go watch it. So, oh, I know that street. Yeah. You can tell any anecdote. Go ahead. What do you think about our country working yeah. here with that amazing direct? Yeah, great. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, yeah, we we did this movie, Mile 22, that Peter Berg uh, directed and Mark Wahlberg starred in and Lauren Cohan. And so we started shooting that film in uh, in a, in Atlanta. I think we, yeah, we were in Atlanta, started filming, and then we went to Columbia for about six weeks. And so um, it was fun. I mean, I, I thought it was a blast. And we ended up getting a really good crew. We found some really good people um in in colombia and we stayed at a, a fun hotel i mean the food the food was killer uh best coffee in the world by the way so the coffee is amazing there um when we first got in we went to the hotel we were so tired and i just thought i'm gonna just have a cup of coffee and i had a cup of coffee and you know there's you have there's a magic to making coffee in colombia you know it's not just like oh pour it up it's like I watched like four minutes and then stir and then I was like, okay. So I had the first cup and I'm like, wow, that was good. And I went and got a second cup and I was like high as a kite the rest of the day. I was like, I felt like I was on drugs, but I was floating in, in on a cloud. Um, but I made sure every morning Lauren Cohan and I had breakfast before we went to set and we would have two cups of, of, of cafe, uh, cafe liche uh, every morning. And it was great. Um, but no, I had a great experience. It was, it was, it was good. You know, I mean, we, I'm glad that Peter wanted to go to Columbia, you know, uh, and, um, not try to fake it somewhere, you know, like, oh, we can shoot that in, you know, New Orleans or something and make it feel it doesn't, he's that sort of guy. It has to be very real to him. So we, so we all went to Columbia for six weeks. And, and, uh, like I said, I had a great crew. They were so nice. And uh, my friend Johnny Villanueva, who does all the hair for J Peter's movies as well, he had a great crew, um, really super nice people. And, uh, you know, I actually was somebody that was working at K&B, Melissa, um, her, she's Colombian. And she flew to Colombia and stayed with her mother. And she worked with us on the show. And she was wonderful and did a great job. And, and um you know, it was, it was, it was good. And, and she also helped me with interpretation as well. I mean, whenever you go to a different country, you learn the language quickly. Unfortunately, when you leave, you forget the language quickly. So I was, I was doing okay for six months or six weeks, uh, speaking, speaking, uh, Spanish. Uh, but, uh, I, I, and I live in LA. I should know it. It's pathetic. I think I spent too much time making monsters and not enough time, uh, focusing on Spanish in high school. Um, but I always say, I need to learn that. I don't know what's wrong with me, but maybe my brain doesn't work that way. It doesn't hold, hold the words in my head. Um, but yeah, no, it was great. Mile 22 was a blast and we had a really good time and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. Very good experience. Oh. Too bad I was living here, not in Bogota when that, when that was filmed. And yeah, man, 
One day I decided to drink the real espresso from Colombia and I was like this the yeah. whole day. But man, great, you had to come back and I think John got something to say, John. Antes del mensaje, la foto. Okay, we are going to take a picture. Okay, now um, I hope I can do this as well. John got three paragraphs and that this is, this is a message for the channel. So I will do it. Okay. Your achievements including your well-deserved Oscar, are a testament to your mastery in the field of visual effects makeup. You have brought to life iconic characters from zombies to other world creatures, defying the expectations and astounding audience around the world. Your creations have been an integral part of some of the most beloved and memorable films in cinema history. On behalf of all film lovers, fan of visual effects and maker arts, artistry, we thank you for, for your unparalleled contribution to the magic of cinema, Your legacy will lead on through the films and characters you had created and the admiration and gratitude for us all. Thank you, Howard, for enriching our lives with your talent and vision. Congratulations on all your achievements and for continuing to inspire us with your exceptional work. And by the way, there is a young and amazing makeup artist called, called Corinne Foley. She says, like we say, we, we love you and we are really inspired. <laughs> ah, well, thank you. Gracias, gracias. I, I, I appreciate that. Thanks. And, and, and listen, thank you very much for, you know, asking me on and, and having a talk. I was looking online. I saw you talked to John Caglione as well. Recently. Oh, yeah. 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 Good old Two Johnny. Oscar winners. Yeah. Johnny Cags. So uh, I, I love John. He's a very funny guy and very, very great makeup artist. So Johnny Cags is a good dude. Good guy. We got two or three but two of the greatest with an Oscar, but I know <laughs> an, an award doesn't define anything because great is amazing. Corey Dean, that is one of the new ones, is amazing. You are you are amazing. All oh, the magics that you make. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Gracias. No, no gracias. No, y, y, y hay que decirle que gracias por tanta inspiración y obviamente que saludamos también a unos colegas de él que es Rupitin y Claro, Fran Darabon también, entonces, un saludo para ellos también. Okay, and, and yes, John, say, always say it, we, we salute your colleagues to, to uh, picking, and of course, the amazing Fran Darabon, hopefully one day on the channel, uh, but no, man, thank you, thank you so much. And by the way, uh, you mentioned the amazing work from The Walking Dead, and it was great also to have here Tulu Temple, Asander Berkeley, mm, it's, oh, it's, it's all magical. The actors, the makeup department, everything. No, man, thank you so much. Thank you Don't so much, Howard. Thank you. Great no. way. God bless you. <laughs> Gracias. Chao, chao. Vuelve a Colombia. Yeah. Vuelve a chao. Colombia. Chao. Chao.